Venha para a 48ª Expo Citrus e 44ª Semana da Citricultura, a maior feira citrícola da América Latina, de 30 de maio a 2 de junho, em Cordeirópolis. Hello, I am Gisel Matos, the general organizer of the Expo Citrus Citrus Week, the most important event in the Brazilian citrus industry for decades. This event is one of my responsibilities at the, at the Silvio Moreira Citrus Research Center with the Agronomic Institute IAC, where a systemic and creative vision for research, relationship and innovation in agri agricultural science is our driving force. The Expo Citrus Citrus Week brings in this 2023 edition a shared vision for solutions for the citrus industry and markets. With this motif, the event provides citrus growers and other participants with an expanded experience for meetings, discussions and business based on a program with 25 lectures and debates during the next week when about 7,000 visitors and 70 exhibitors of products and service cooperatives, official entities and groups of consultants will meet. I kindly ask everyone's permission this minute to continue my speech in Portuguese for our general audience. Bem, com o objetivo de trazer informações de qualidade e apoiar o desenvolvimento sustentável da citricultura, a Expositio Semana da Citricultura abriu oportunidade para o webinar de pré-lançamento do evento, apresentado aqui por um palestrante de destaque. O tema Suco de Laranja Brasileiro, colaboração entre o os atores da cadeia de suprimento no desenvolvimento sustentável, traz essa visão compartilhada com colegas e formadores de opinião aqui no Brasil. Atanasius Mend é engenheiro agrônomo com experiência em desenvolvimento sustentável nos setores de produtos frescos e bebidas. Ele promoveu comunidades agrícolas em todo o mundo por meio do comércio e da tecnologia. Ata, como conhecido pelos amigos, ocupa a presidência da plataforma de sucos sustentáveis desde 2019. É um prazer contar com a presença de vocês, nosso grande agradecimento. Após sua apresentação, teremos uma breve sessão de perguntas e respostas. Então, Ata, seja bem-vindo ao nosso evento, a audiência é sua. Desejamos uma bom, boa apresentação, um bom trabalho nessa noite aqui no Brasil. Obrigado. Acho que você Unmute. Yep. Can you hear me, Divisal? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you, Divisal, for this opportunity um, for me to present uh, at the Expo Citrus. This is the first uh, time and, and hopefully the first opportunity uh, for a continued relationship um, with Brazilian actors, in particular the farming community. Um, I have prepared a presentation, so I will begin by running this. Um, there is a pre-recording, so I'll be going through the presentation and look forward to receiving questions at the end. Great. Let's see. We don't have the sound. You, you don't have the sound. Is it not no. loud enough? No. Could you check that? Okay. Okay. I'll need to speak all with. Let me. Okay. Is that coming through? Or is it still too quiet? If so. Not yet. We are okay. checking. I, I will speak. It, it may be not loud enough. I'll try this. Atta, um, so our technical people here, you should um, make it able to share your audio. I don't know if on the settings of your computer. It should be. Let me escape one second. Okay. 
Is it? Or if you feel more comfortable, we can go I can, ahead I can, and listen to I can, you. I can speak. I, I can speak yeah, over. Good. I, I think I think the sound is too low. Apologies. Um, okay, so the contents um, today, just just to introduce uh, some concepts of sustainable development, uh, and I will use that as a basis. Uh, one to identify patterns of sustainable development and the rationale for collaboration uh, among all supply chain actors. Um, I would then like to take the opportunity to introduce some of the work we do at the Sustainable Juice platform uh, and uh, and uh, give some examples of the collaborative case, case studies in particular that we're doing in partnership with um, partners and actors in Brazil. Okay, so what do we mean by sustainable development? Uh, one of the common and accepted definitions uh, is from the Brunsland report, which states that development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So, so let, let's explore this a little bit further. Um, one way of expressing this uh, pictorially is, is the systems approach. Uh, it may be known as the triple bottom line, triple bottom line. Um, of respecting people, planet, and profitability. Um, whereas this is good for describing the trade-offs between the three pillars, what it doesn't allow is um, an opportunity to balance uh, the priorities between those three pillars, which takes priority and when. And in addition, it doesn't allow us to square between the generations. So what is important for us in terms of our needs today versus future generations. Moving on from this, we have what is known as the capital approach. Um, this addresses transgenerational -gen needs by uh, representing sustainable development by fixed assets or a portfolio of assets and we have three main reasons. One is physical capital. Uh, these are the things we make, for example, orange juice. Uh, we then have human capital, which is based on the labor required to make the things uh, and the skill sets of that labor. And the third uh, uh, asset in that portfolio is what we call natural capital. That is the land and other resources like water, and ecosystem services provided, by example, pollinators and other beneficial insects. So what this allows us to do is consider assets in terms of um, losses. So we can't, for example, uh, deforest all of our primary forests to make agricultural production. We can't extract water from all the groundwater to grow crops, we recognize there are assets worth preserving uh, and there are thresholds there. Um, what it still doesn't allow us to do is assign full valuation to all the assets, in particular natural capital. Although there's natural capital accounting um, becoming part of national uh, GDP, um, it's hard to capture all of that capital. Um, and in terms of sustainable development, every sector has to consider its materiality impacts. Um, so we need to determine as a sector where are those greatest impacts and where do we have the greatest leverage to do something. Um, and in the case of agriculture, and, and I speak for agriculture in the broadest global sense, not, not any uh, particular sector, but if we look at agriculture, we have transgressed two of the planetary boundaries. One is the biochemical flows with the use of uh, fertilizers. And then the other one is biosphere integrity through the loss of biodiversity, both in terms of genetic diversity. So we have nine crops responsible for nearly three quarters of our human uh, consumption and also uh, biodiversity loss in the wider environment. 
And the final thing to consider is that when we talk about sustainability, we're not just targeting the farm and the farm has got specific topics or themes it needs to consider. But those um, issues of sustainable development are uh, present in all steps of the supply from farm inputs through to consumers and end of life. Uh, the topics may change at each step of the supply chain, uh, but it impacts all supply chain actors. Okay, so based on these concepts and frameworks, let's see how we can identify patterns of, of sustainable development and leading on from there, the rationale for collaboration. So first of all, why, why do we collaborate? Uh, firstly, as individual farms or firms, we have limited leverage over supply chain issues. Some of us, particularly small smallholder farmers or small firms may have limited resources to deal with the issues. In terms of larger firms, um, they have greater brand exposure to negative campaigning and they want to benefit from a first mover advantage by, um, by making a statement or a position on sustainability and also attempts to address uh, sustainability can mitigate against some of the supply chain risks we face. It can mitigate regulatory creep and uh, hopefully mitigate against some of the negative campaigning which takes place. So these are just some examples of why there are benefits to collaborate. And another way of looking at this is there are three push and pull drivers uh, which uh, uh, induce innovation on sustainability. Um, one of them is regulatory push, so changes or, or evolution of regulation. Another one is a technological push, and that could come. So, for example, in the case of the Brazilian citriculture, citriculture we've got um, uh, experts, research institutes like the Centro de Citicultura, Fundi Citrus, and others, and advances in research and innovation can drive change. And then the other one is the market pull. So this is where consumer awareness, negative campaigning um, creates um, a, a particular pull on, on, on the driver of sustainability. So different actors in a supply chain may experience different uh, push and pull, but we're all subject to those uh, factors. Um, and, and then just to try and visualize this differently, uh, the only thing we have full control over is what we do as individual farms or firms. Um, we have negligible control over legislation. Uh, we have negligible control over uh, any negative or critical activity against us. Um, but where we can come together again, if we collaborate as a sector, uh, that gives us an element of control to try and negate uh, against the um, legislation and, and critical campaigning. Um, and again, so what we're trying to do collectively from farmers through to uh, manufacturers and retailers is we're trying to reach good governance. So if we add all of our activity, we can add what we do on regula regulatory compliance we can add what we do as a sector. Uh, we can do add what we do voluntarily in terms of our individual organizations. We may still be left with what we call a governance gap. And, and, and this governance gap is occupied by transgressional um, planetary boundaries like we discussed. Um, but it's also the space where we see negative campaigning, regulatory creep, and market intervention. So the reality is that if we collectively, we may not may we may not want to face into all of the challenges. We may not even agree on all of the negative campaigning, um, irrespective of the perception whether it's right or wrong. Unless we develop a narrative and a um, an action towards 
addressing or mitigating this governance gap, it will be filled uh, by others. Um, and then just quickly to note that there is resistance to collaboration. collaboration. Uh, some firms see sustainability as um, a competitive, a commercial competitiveness. Uh, and there are also resistances faced within different types of organizational structure. I won't dwell on too much uh, for the sake of time. I won't dwell on different types of organizational structures. However, what I would say is that sustainability or the sustainability challenges, if they are approached in the right way, rec represent probably the biggest opportunities we have as a sector. It does take a lot of investment, uh, building up of uh, capabilities uh, among supply chain actors along the entire supply chain, um, and hence another reason for collaboration but we can turn challenges into opportunities. So what I wanna give now is a couple of examples of how we can uh, um, identify patterns in what happens on sustainability. I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. The first one is pesticide residues. Um, in terms of legislation, we have international conventions um, which govern banned and severely prohibited uh, pesticides. In terms of destinations, uh, there are maximum resi residue levels. I've given the example of the UK and Europe because that's the example I'm going to give here, but it applies to both national legislation in Brazil and any other destination markets. Um, in terms of an industry, we have a wealth of certification standards ranging from global gap, which is more for fresh produce. Uh, side platform has the FSA, uh, there's Fair Trade, Rainforest Alliance, to name a few. And also the citriculture industry in Brazil has got its own uh, reduced pesticide list. In addition, on self-regulation, we see retailers with their own pesticide lists or maybe reduced pesticide residue levels. Uh, and then we've got individual farms or farm management groups having their own inter integrated pest management program. And then the campaigning, um, we've got some NGOs with pesticide league tables, uh, there's consumer pressure groups. And what we see here in terms of pesticides is there's a, an ongoing um, publications of scientific reports which continue to highlight um, the toxicity of pesticides in terms of human health, uh, both for workers and uh, consumers, and and uh, toxicity to the environment. And what happens on the back of this is we see what we call the regulatory creep. So in terms of the European Union, we see the Green Deal. Uh, so both the farm to fork and biodiversity strategies highlight a need to reduce pesticides by 50, so reduced use and risk of pesticides by 50% by 2030. And in addition, there's a list of other toxic substances which the European Union has highlighted for substitution. Um, the next example I'll, I'll give you is um, on packaging. So um, obviously all of that fantastic orange juice needs to be packed and a lot of it gets packed into plastic packaging. Um, globally, we produce over 141 million tonnes of plastic, of which a third ends up leaking from collection systems and polluting the environment, oh. and it's a major contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. So um, I just want to highlight the waste hierarchy. So the priority or is to avoid waste in the first place. In other words, not to use plastic in this case. And at the bottom of the hierarchy is disposal. So we want to go way to the top as much as we can. So I'll bear this in mind as we look at the legislation. So if we look at regulation that was in the UK, uh, at the time, UK before Brexit was harmonized with European legislation. So you can see a lot of European legislation. All of that, um, all of that regulation concerns waste management. 
Um, there are sector activities um, on by RAP on the UK Plastics Act and a deposit return scheme. Individual organisations can uh, optimise their packaging. And again, we see negative campaigning, uh, um, social environmental pressure groups campaigning against plastic. Here we have another trigger event, and this was by um, David Attenborough, um, a, a, a wildlife presenter. Uh, he presented the second series of The Planet, which highlighted plastic pollution, and, and this triggered a major response in Europe. And on the back of that response, for the first time, we see regulation not on waste management, but waste prevention. Um, one is on single-use plastic, like plastic straws. And in the UK, there's a plastics packaging tax, uh, which is on virgin plastic material. I can give other examples, but what, what, is, what we see as a pattern is we may not know what, what is the trigger or the focus event. We don't know when it will occur. However, we can see the patterns in that, in that governance gap, um, which allows us to predict and prepare based on where we're seeing critical, critical campaigning taking place and where we should expect regulatory creep to happen. So again, I stress that the need for collaboration Again, we we face many headwinds, uh, and those headwinds differ whether you're a, a farmer in Brazil or a European retailer. But collectively, if if we're not on top or ahead of the curve, then that space will be occupied by uh, negative activities. Um, okay, so with with that in mind, let me take this opportunity to introduce to you the sustainable juice platform. It was formerly known as the Juice CSR platform. We were founded in 2013. Uh, it was a co-initiative by the European Fruit Juice Association, the AIJN and some other bodies. Uh, and whereas we were initially co-funded by the European Commission for the first 18 months, we are now only funded by 45 international members. And those members represent over 90% of juice traded in Europe. Uh, our vision is to inspire, guide and support fruit juice actors to integrate corporate social responsibility in their business operations and core strategy. And our roles are to facilitate and support collaboration, ensure quality and sector-wide participation, and to communicate and harmonize efforts. Uh, our principles are based on the UN Global Compact Food and agricultural business principles. And we're a members led organization. We're not not for profit organization. Our members elect member category representatives to the steering committee. Um, our members um, uh, confirm the strategy for the year ahead. They approve the budget and the direction of activities. Uh, the steering committee is responsible for acting out uh, that strategy and managing the budget. Um, as a steering committee, um, we have a democratic process. Uh, the member category representatives each have a uh, have a vote, and it's a um, majority vote. No one uh, has a has a veto. And we've got platform management services provided by Fair and Sustainable and, and the AIJN is our secretariat. Uh, we have three activities. One is working groups, uh, the second is projects, and the third one is educational initiatives. We'll go through those in a few more, in a bit more detail. Um, but just to mention a little bit about the steering committee, the eight member categories are range from producers through to uh, permanent uh, members represented by the AIJN and the International Fruit and Vegetable Juice Association. Um, and as mentioned, uh, one members in each category elect one uh, member to go to the steering committee. Um, as mentioned, we've got three activities. The first one is mitigation. So these are where we uh, intervene in hotspots or risks within our supply chains. Uh, we do have working groups uh, focused on mitigating these risks 
Um, uh, as a steering committee, we do have a discretionary budget on some spends in this area. Um, on projects, we can identify and collaborate uh, on projects. So we have a tool called Spotlight. This allows members to upload uh, the themes and supply chains of interest and where we see common ground, uh, try and explore further to see whether enough members are interested in undertaking a project. Uh, and we'll look at examples of this short link. Um, and finally, uh, as part of the raising awareness, uh, we, we, we look at educational opportunities as well. Okay, so now I just wanna go through a few uh, recent case studies that we as a platform have either funded or co-funded. Um, so I will start off with the mitigation activities. Um, back in 2018, uh, we sent a 50 strong delegation, including retailers to Brazil, and that was with the objective of having a better understanding of the sustainability challenges um, our Brazilian uh, supply chain actors were facing. We were kindly hosted uh, over a 10 day period um, by various actors. And um, it was that information which allowed us as a platform to identify where our, our key focus uh, and areas of interest were. Um, and although we as a platform uh, are not directly involved, we do have some members active in the project which came out of this in, uh, initiation, uh, and that's the Fruto Resiliente, uh, which I'm, I'm hoping most of you should be uh, aware about. And, and that's a, a project which is being implemented by Solidaridad in Brazil um, and includes members uh, like Coca-Cola, Innocent Drinks, Ekes and Kutrali, and that's to implement um, working conditions and the site platform FSA sustainability standards uh, among smallholder farms. Uh, a second um, mitigation activity was back in 2020. Uh, we collaborated with the Sustainable Trade Initiative and a the German-based Panal, which is um, an organization established by the German Ministry of Trade. And that was, uh, we commissioned the first living wage for the orange juice sector, for the orange sector in the states of Sao Paulo and Minas Gerais. Uh, the work was undertaken by the anchors. Um, I, I know this is contentious. Um, I do want to make it clear that undertaking the living wage report is not a precursor to any demands being placed. Uh, for the implementation of a living wage. We do recognize as members that there are structural challenges in Brazil. I think when we attended uh, one of the meetings, uh, we were informed that 80% of Brazilians, for example, are living below the poverty line. Uh, we know the industry faces major commercial diseases such as greening, which affect productivity. Um, and then th this one is less aimed at Brazilian actors and more um, amongst my um, cohorts and colleagues here in Europe is that we recognize that there is inequity in terms of the distribution of value and wealth in the supply chain. And, and also we need a more nuanced approach in recognizing some of the soft benefits uh, the industry provides workers. Um, so... What I would say is, again, going back to the push and pull factors, and um, I, I don't want it to be seen as a conflict of interest, but just different supply chain actors are facing different uh, pressures. Um, it is a space uh, which some of our members, in particular retailers, uh, do receive a lot of pressure, and hence why the interest in undertaking a living wage study. Um, Thirdly, uh, you know, we, we've done a mitigation work historically, um, and, and that was an ad hoc uh, basis, and we thought we'd want to do a little bit more due diligence. So in 2021, um, the platform commissioned, commissioned a sustainability consultancy firm and thesis to undertake a, a risk report on key supply chains within our juice industry. Uh, that was based on looking at social and environmental indicators and the European legislation. Uh, and and it, it, there was a limitation. It was a country and crop desktop research. It was conducted in English. 
now qualitative interviews with supply chain actors, particularly on the ground. So, so we recognize the limitations, but it was an initial stage to see um, what the status looked like. Um, and like I said, that, that report was on the, the first step in a series of steps. Uh, we opened the report to public consultation, just to recite from actors on the ground. Um, we have revised those risks accordingly. Um, and now we, we've just set up a mitigation working group uh, and that is still at the exploratory phase. So here we are inviting supply chain actors um, to get involved because what we really want to do is stress test the thinking of those uh, risks um, to determine, you know, is that the reality on the ground or, you know, are we missing something or is the the information that we've been provided, is it old, is it obsolete? Is it, not referent, is it not relevant for the supply chain we're in? And once we've had that exploratory phase, we can then determine which priority areas focus on. Um, like I said, we've done we've done ten supply chains. Uh, these are the the main risks that have been flagged in terms of Brazilian orange. Uh, the first appears to be on worker rights. And like I said, that the, the, there is <laughs> that there is nothing more coming out. The next stage is exploratory, and, and this is again in the spirit of co collaboration. We welcome uh, Brazilian actors to get involved uh, with our mitigation working group um, to hear your voices and make sure there's good engagement and participation and understanding from our side about the reality that that is experienced so we may if there is any work in this area it's something that's common um commonly understood and agreed upon um moving on to projects um so the first uh, project is um the exploration of the contribution of ecosystem services provided by wild pollinators and natural enemies in the biomes of mata atlantica and the so this is being coordinated by professors Osmar Malaspina and Roberta Cornelio Ferreira Nocelli, and the main researcher being Glaciani Burga Patricio Roberto, and their colleagues um, from Sao Paulo State University and the Federal University of Sao Carlos. Uh, I would also like to point out that uh, I know um, the team has re received support from Fundicitlas in the design and uh, allocation of farms. So what we're doing here is um, we've identified six farms. Each farm has got two trial plots, um, all in the state of Sao Paulo. Three of the farms are located in Mata Atlantica and three of the, the farms are located in, in the Cerrado. And what we're doing, at, at we found farms that are bordering the natural conservation areas. And we are uh, three times during the cropping cycle, we will we have started assessing the presence in terms of population and species, uh, pollinators, commercial pests, and natural enemies. Um, and we'll also assess food yield quality at those distances to try and determine a correlation between distance and effect. The hypothesis is the further we move away from natural conservation areas, which uh, represent an abundance of natural enemies, the, the less presence of beneficial insects uh, we see, the further we move away. So that's the hypothesis we're testing. Um, it, it is an extension of uh, in, uh, in Spain. There we've um, introduced uh, treatments with a wildflower uh, a strip. And what we're seeing is that the wildflower strips are encouraging more pollinators. And that is appearing in the early research or the early data. It's contributing favorably to fruit sets. And um, the wildflower and grass strips are also encouraging great activity of pollinators and natural enemies. Uh, we can present more when that research is finished. Um, the, the second one was um, trying to support, I, I, I don't know the status, I need to speak to side platform, but I know at one stage they were looking at an FSA accelerator program uh, to uh, increase 
sustainably certified or verified farms. Uh, I know with the Fruto Resiliente, there's a desire to extend the project. Either one of these or both uh, represent an opportunity for the platform uh, to get involved and uh, support um, a greater sustainability. And, and uh, great to hear that the uh, research farm um, uh, owned by the Centre de Cidicultura Cid 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 has achieved FSA gold. So that's fantastic. I believe it's the first research station that has achieved FSA status. Um, and the final example I want to give is, is on education. So one of the initiatives or the co-initiatives was uh, Juice and Environmental um, Deep Dive or JED, JED Talks. And that was an, a co-initiative with the European Juice Association, the Sustainable Juice Covenant and the International Fruit and Vegetable Juice Association. And the aim of this initiative is to inform and promote some of the good case studies taking place on various environmental themes within juice supply chains. Uh, the first webinar was on biodiversity. We will be looking at um, two or three other environmental themes this year. Uh, and we were very pleased to uh, have Dr. Franklin Bello of Fundi Citrus to present uh, at the webinar. And, and the topic was the coexistence between citriculture and beekeeping. So that's just an example of what we're trying to do in terms of promoting some of the great uh, research and, and you know, good agricultural practices that are present in the Brazilian supply chain. Um, so just to summarize, um, before I hand over for any question answers, um, as a platform, we are a recognized organization dealing with sustainability issues, specifically within the juice sector. Um, and due to our structure and our membership, uh, which represents the entire supply chain, uh, we can provide necessary leverage where other organizations may have limitations. Having said that, we, we would welcome um, stronger representation from the farming community, whether that's Brazilian citrus or other supply chains, uh, we, we really would like to have more uh, farmers' voices being uh, represented on our platform. Um, we have a proven track record addressing controversial issues, ho hopefully with a, a degree of uh, sensitivity and um, empathy uh, and our ability to engage with critical actors. So, so for example, the living wage study um, the German association, uh, one of the uh, members is uh, the Cristiano Romero uh, initiative. Uh, you may know them, that they, they have been campaigning uh, uh, for the improvement of worker rights and living wage and, and other issues within the supply chain. Um, and, and, and I think they uh, had a much better understanding after we engaged with them uh, through the, the German panel association that had a much greater understanding of the uh, challenges the industry faces and and and, and, and that forges uh, better relationships so yeah just just to finalize look uh, again once again thank you for giving me this opportunity to air um some of the activities we do as a platform but we you know it, it is a call um to brazilian actors um you know, we do welcome a, a direct or even an indirect collaboration uh, to make sure that, you know, we, we do have representation uh, or greater representation um, from upstream actors uh, when dealing with challenges that affects us all. So in that spirit, you know, hopefully you can see why one, why we're reaching out, but but more importantly, why we collectively need to ensure that we uh, collaborate on sustainability because the, the challenges may be different, the pressures may be different, but collectively that they add up and we all need to work together. So thank you for listening to me and thank you for your time. I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen now. Over, over to you, Dirsel. Hello, Arthur. 
Thanks I did for so. this nice presentation. It was a pleasure for and um, it's open for questions with our audience. If not, I'm I'm very uh, interested to uh, ask you about your points uh, okay. that you presented. Um, we can use the chat if you're not comfortable uh, about uh, making the questions personally. You can, uh, it's for the audience, you can make your questions in Portuguese or in English or write on the chat and we can take that to Ata. Okay. Well, let me uh, start. Uh, this morning I was on another webinar and they say uh, they said that uh, I should break the ice. <laughs> Let's go. Um, that, that was very interesting and it was very handy to uh, to know about the sustainable juice platform and all the initiatives in Europe. We were not much aware about that. That's, uh, that's true. And you gave us some case studies. You also present some projects and projects developed here in Brazil with uh, universities like the University of São Carlos and the uh, University of the State of São Paulo, close to our Citrus Center here. And uh, the point is, we did not hear much about those developed projects and even about the results. Uh, is that true or do you agree with that? If so, why? Uh, the info, the information or the results were only disclosed uh, uh, with the European Union and community. And how we, we can bring that and, and make some more assertive um, strategies for the citrus sustainability in Brazil? That's the point. Yeah. Yeah, good. So thank you, yourself for your question. Um, the look, and I, I acknowledge maybe there could have been better communication. Again, I think establishing these relationships like we have today gives us the opportunity to share knowledge, activities, opportunities. Uh, but, but the project commenced at the back end of last year. Uh, it's still work in progress, so nothing has been published. Or, or even being shared with any members. The only thing we have shared so as part of the project, uh, when we're funding or co-funding, we have certain targets or milestones. So we just update members that we're on track, uh, that we've met the milestones. Um, so we were, we're, we're, we've done two of the three uh, field inspections, the third survey, um, due um, and, and then we're waiting for the harvest to try and correlate the field inspections with the harvest yield and quality. Once that work is complete um, and, the, and the data is processed for sure, um, uh, assuming uh, the partners don't raise any objections and in academia I can't imagine anyone objecting but, but the, the findings will be shared with the wider community. So it will be published. Uh, what I can do, so I can speak to um, the coordinators to see whether they are in a position to release uh, an interim report that we can get to uh, the community in Brazil just to just to be aware of what is happening. We, we I'll, I'll raise that at the next committee meeting. Well, uh, that would be great because I think that we can start with new discussions based on, on such kind of data and have more contact. And I'm thankful for the opportunity to have the Sustainable Juice platform here and you here is speaking about that. Another point is about case studies and you mentioned about the Citrus Resilient. We collaborate with uh, Solidaridad Foundation uh, Guilherme Ortega is here, listen to us, and I would like to, to know uh, about uh, if you have followed, if the platform has followed the results, uh, obviously we just start, or Fruto Resilient just started by 2019 during the pandemics, 
But what do you see about the fruit resilient results? Uh, have you followed such achievements and, and you feel that we are on the right way and with such actions? Yeah, thank you, Teresa. Um, I'm aware of the activities partly because the initial phase, um, as a chair, we were trying to get the project approved um, with, with Brazilian actors to to work with the platform. Uh, regrettably, that that didn't materialize uh, for a few reasons. Um, but I, I do consult for Innocent Drinks. Um, and Innocent Drinks is on the committee, so I'm aware of the progress being made. And, and for me, again, from, from my understanding, due to Brazilian legislation, that Brazilian processors cannot get directly involved in legal issues with the farming community because they then become uh, rely, um, culpable, uh, responsible. Um, so having Solidaridad as a, as a uh, implementing partner is is critical for this uh, and from what I've seen I know, I know there's been a significant investment in uh, educational material um, training uh, in particular some of the uh, work we've done like soil analysis uh, to determine optimum fertilizers I think some of some of those services have been very well received by the smallholders uh, that they see the economic benefits uh, with with those and uh, I I think I, I know it's been uh, the traction has been a little bit slower than we would have liked but I think um, there was COVID as well and that prevented uh, the rollout plan um, but, but I, I like that I, I see Guilherme I see I think Rodrigo Guilherme I, I don't think there might be one or two years yeah, Guilherme is here. So, if they want to add more more information, but I love for for me, it's it's a kind of an initiative where, um, you, you know, farmers are being heard. We're trying to address their needs. Uh, we're trying to provide uh, economic incentives. We we recognise many smallholders have left orange production, and unless we make orange um, production economically viable um, then all the discussion about sustainability or on environmental or worker rights becomes meaningless <laughs> so so we need viable farms um, and and from what I'm seeing I, I think we're on the right we're on the right road yeah. well uh, thanks a lot for your insights on on, on this. And actually, we will have uh, a Fundação Solidar and Fruto Resiliente uh, during the Expo Citrus and interacting, bringing the, the growers, the citrus growers, to the environment where we share information and Fantastic. we can promote um, more enthusiasm with them and give them uh, more basics on production. And that is the point that we discussed when planning this, this webinar, that how uh, they or they must be engaged with uh, this um, business on sustainability. Let's say business on sustainability. They they need to make profit of their production, and also they have to understand and be invited to participate in this process. And then it's very very important on, on my opinion, of course. But that's it. Well. Uh, if you don't have any other questions, uh, I'm sorry for uh, no, no, making all the... the... I, I don't know if Daniel still has a question. Well, please. I don't know. That's all. Uh, good, good evening. At, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. At, I pleasure, have two, 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 one comment and uh, a question for you. Uh, the sustainable juice platform, the, actually one of the first initiatives also with Solidaridad was uh, based in Paraná state with a group of growers uh, in Citri. So as this, uh, it's important also to be aware that this initiative also uh, had an important contribution from 
Parana Growers and uh, C3 uh, organization. Just wanted to share that is the history is, is longer than that. And uh, a question uh, I, I have for you, uh, how important is for growers, organizations, cooperatives to participate even institutionally in this uh, platform? how this could contribute also to the image of the sector in the European markets. Also, I think it's important to, to if you can, to uh, raise this issue that the platform is uh, open to, to growers, organizations and processors to hear more the voice from Brazil. Thank, thank you, Daniel. Uh, yeah, yeah, I acknowledge uh, previous work. I, I was just highlighting more recent activity, but you're right, the, the work dates back further than this. Um, to answer your question on um, smallholders, look, we, we recognize a lot of the uh, food supply chains uh, or, or our food security relies heavily on smallholders uh, around the world and yes it may be more complex uh, dealing with smallholders um, in terms of coordination um, and, and and management but but the reality is um, we, we, need, we need to embrace this so for me it, it you, you know it, it the, the the one I want to do is uh, dismiss or oversee smallholders or producer groups because because they're more complex uh, that th that's not the right approach so for me um ha having in general having uh farming uh groups farm group representations um it, it, it is key for for because what we don't want to see is and I'm hoping that the work we do, it is it is not seen and it's not in, intended to be seen um, as something that is being imposed by us in the global north. Um, we do, you know, we don't want the farming community to be recipients of, I don't know, initiatives, in, directives. We 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 need we we don't want we need we need the farming community to to be to be engaged uh, to be participating to be given agency <laughs> um in in um you know they're, they're the custodians of the land they're producing the foods we consume the the juice that we drink um so it, it is only right and just uh that farming communities um have agency in in this whole discussion um so yes we welcome all uh farming communities, but in particular, we should be mindful and sensitive to uh, smallholders. Uh, so, you know, f farm management groups or cooperatives are very much welcome in that discussion. Venha para a 48ª Expo Citrus e 44ª Semana da Citricultura, a maior feira citrícola da América Latina. De 30 de maio a 2 de junho, em Cordeirópolis. Música